Hi everyone. Hello. Time for another Ask Ally self-publishing advice, a podcast, poetry podcast. And I am here this evening to talk about a topic that I know is of interest to a lot of you, which is editing poetry and uh, the demands of that and the and the joys of that. And I'm here with John Davis, who is um, an established poet himself, a prize winning poet, but also a poetry editor. Hi, John. Hello, how are you? I'm good. How are you over there? And where exactly are you? I am in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where it is currently snowing. Yesterday, you could have worn, or the day before yesterday, you could have worn shorts and a t-shirt. And now it is 18 degree, or 20 degrees and snowing. Summer is over. Winter is here. <laughs> but we get a long, slow kind of autumn between those two things. Yeah, so, we're yeah. supposed to. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for coming in uh, to talk to us about poetry editing. Um, it's a topic that um, our poetry listeners have wanted to, us to, to kind of tackle for a while. Um, but before we get get stuck into it, just talk to me, tell tell the people a little bit about you as a poet. Every poet is so different. Talk to us a little bit about your genre, uh, about your teaching experience. I know you have a lot of teaching experience um, and about how you came to editing and, and, and why you do it, why you enjoy it. All right. Uh, I start. Yeah, I started kind of unusually for somebody who ends up being a literary poet. I started, uh, I was a construction worker. I was 19. And I, I I think it was probably Bob Dylan and Neil Young. And, you know, it was the, the folk rock musicians who got me interested in words. And then, I, so then I started, like I started writing and just filling up notebooks. And at first I had no idea what I was doing. But I got really interested in poetry, so I started reading. And then once I started reading, I started imitating. I started, like, what are these people doing? And I, I figured it out on my own, started publishing. And then when I was 26, I sent, here's how I got into college. I sent a letter to a poet who taught at a school in, in I lived in Connecticut at the time. I sent a letter to him and, with some poems and said I wanted to go to school. This is what I, this was my idea of getting into school. And he loved the poems. And he said, come and take any course you want. And that was the beginning of my college career, which uh, continued on until I got an MFA um, at the University of Montana. Uh, so I did it backwards, but I'm, it was good because when I went in, I knew what I wanted to resist and what I wanted to accept. I kind of knew what I wanted from poetry. So it worked. Um, and then I, I, uh, I think it's a better way around actually than the, the normal trajectory because I think once yeah. you've had the experience of actually doing it, that you'll get a lot more value out of the trouble with a lot of MFA is it's it stifles the creativity and and ca it can, I mean, not necessarily, but it can yeah. do for a lot of people, yeah, especially if you're younger. I mean, I, the successful MFA students generally are older, um, have been out in the world and come back to school. That used to be the model. Like going straight through was very unusual um, when I was going to school. Uh, so, and then I uh, I started teaching at Salisbury University in Maryland. I taught there for a couple of years. And then I came to Santa Fe and I got a job at the Institute of American Indian Arts. And, and I loved it right away. And I stayed there for 23 years teaching poetry. Really, at the undergraduate level, we had amazing successes with students. Um, and then I started a graduate program. <laughs> I started an MFA program. And uh, that was exhausting, but it was rewarding because it was a group of people, Native Americans, who were not largely often represented in MFA programs. And uh, and it was people who came with a lot of experience to the work. And so it had that, had that quality, too, that I was talking about. Um, and then I retired. And now that I'm retired, I'm working harder than ever. Um, and part of it's editing for Book Fox, which has been a, a lot of fun. And uh, just a, a diversity of poetry that I didn't get in the MFA. So I, I've learned about things that I had no idea about originally. Um, and then uh, I'm also writing a, a nonfiction book and my own poetry. So. So you're still busy. You're not retired at all. <laughs> no, I, I keep, 
joking. I have to retire from my retirement. <laughs> Absolutely. OK, so today we're going to talk um, specifically. We could go so many different ways with this, but specifically how to work with an editor as a poet, as a self-publishing poet, particularly how to work with an editor to get the most most value from that relationship. And uh, we will look at um, developmentally working with poetry, then, you know, the copy edit and the proofreading down at the kind of the word level. And we look at, at um, the poem itself, chapbooks and uh, editing a full collection, because these are all different kinds of editing. So we've kind of got a lot to, to get through. And I, we, you also made the kind invitation that if somebody wants to drop a short poem into the comments here, that you might be able to do a very, you know, surface first read and editorial commentary if that is useful or of interest. So can we start um, just talking about poetry, you know, developmentally when you get a poem first of all what what's the first thing you do and and what should our poets be aware of when they are sending the poem to an editor right well the first thing and I and, and I've learned this it's really important to kind of know what the author intends I, um, you know so I get a certain number of poets who are clearly have their eye on the literary market, you know, the journals. The, uh, not everybody wants that, but that, you know, I can t tell pretty quickly who those people are and I know exactly where to go. So it'd be a different process with them. And then I have a certain number, I have a, quite a few uh, like therapists, people involved in uh, kind of spiritual, you know, thinking. And, uh, and, and so that's another different approach. Um, Often those are uh, haiku poets are kind of writing brief poems that are trying to transmit a message, but poetically, you know, not, not as academics. And then I have, you know, uh, poets in the vein, say, of uh, Rupi Kaur, uh, poets who are writing about personal things. Um, and they're not headed in, they're not all headed in the same direction. And so the first thing to determine is like, what do you want as a writer um, from your poem? Do you want to self-publish? Do you want to seek publishing? You know, do you want to follow the literary path? And once, so at first I, I, it took me a while to sort those out. I mean, and there's other kinds of poetry too. There are people who are writing performance poetry. So you need to know what they want from their work. Uh, and then once I have that, then I go at, go at it a different way for each kind of territory. But for those who are writing in more in the, the Rupi Kaur or the kind of self-help um, or <clears throat> inspirational verse, it's more about taking some of the qualities of a literary poet, um, you know, looking closely at word choice, looking closely at what a line is for you, you know, what is the shape of the poem? Um, looking closely at the use of imagery. So it's the same things I would look at as an academic, but it's not doesn't have the same pressure on it. Um, but that all those techniques can be useful. Um, clarity, you know, like clearing up passages that are muddy, um, all of that, and then the totality of the poem. Like where is it going, and has it gotten there? You know, where do you want it to go, and can we get it to arrive there? So that's the first thing. It's like determining what you want. Um, and it's, it's so often I'll ask now. In the beginning, I, I tried to assume, but I think it's much better to ask uh, as an editor. Just say, okay, what, what do you want to do with these poems? And so that's, that's been my process initially. And do people send you one poem? Do they send you, you know, chapbook size, collection? What do you tend to get? Um, I get everything. Um, I don't get, I'm, a, I'm not a book fox. John Fox, who runs Book Fox, knows what he's doing. And he doesn't allow me really to do under 10 poems. You know, so if somebody comes in and they send me one poem, you know, he says, just tell them, keep writing. You know, when you get 10, um, send them on to me, 10 pages of poetry. Um, and that's been a good process, I, I think. And some people have said, okay, I'll be back. Yeah. You know, don't worry, I'll be back. I'm, I'm going to do this. So 10, 10 is actually my favorite. Uh, because I, it usually means I'm getting somebody kind of early in their writing career and I can kind of 
make some corrections and some course adjustments, some larger course adjustments, so that as they move towards the chapbook in the book, they've, they've already had some preparation for the kinds of changes they'll need to make. Um, but having said that, I do get chapbooks and books. And um, the only difference really with a chapbook and a book is that you're looking at, then you need to look at the shape of the book and the shape of the chapbook. Why is this a chapbook? You know, is there a unifying, especially with chapbooks, is there, because it's so short, is, is there a unifying style? Is there a unifying message? Uh, so I look at that and then I look at the order and why why this order, you know, what's the, what's the development here? And it, there's no answer to that unless you look at each chapbook indi individually. I mean, it really is an individual art and, and, and you have to look at it that way. Um, and books can be more varied. You know, you can have sections in a book. So, you, you know, basically each section can be like a chapbook uh, on its own. But with a chapbook, I like to look for some sort of unifying reason that it's a chapbook. And in terms of what a, no, a poet needs to be aware of in terms of working with an editor, do you have any tips um, for poets as to how to get the most out of the relationship? Yeah, well, I mean, it's yeah, two things right away. One is that you know, let the let let the editor know where you're headed. Um, I think that's really important. I I, I ran a follow that early on. You know, I, I saw somebody who was writing. Um, more of a, I mean, she was a therapist and she was writing a, a kind of self-help poetry, but I saw literary qualities and I started pushing that direction and, but she didn't really want to go there. And so that, I figured that out. Um, so tell, tell the editor what you want. If you're a literary poet, tell them, you know, tell them this is where I want to go. Um, if you're not, tell them where you want to go. That's done. Um, the second thing that I found useful is especially with the 10 poet package that we do i offer at half the price of the first edit to look at them again and that's been the most useful thing for the poets who have done that and it's the most useful thing for me because then i can say okay you know this advice was good advice or sometimes i'll say uh, i thought that was a good idea but it's not because sometimes you can't tell until the poems are reconstituted following whatever ideas you had so that's been, you know, I would totally recommend that uh, as a process. And in, it sounds very much like your editing um, is is closely aligned to your teaching, you know, that you see editing almost as a, a teaching process as well as it's not just simple feedback on, on word choice or whatever. It's like you're trying to encourage to, um, the poet development of the poet as well as the poem it sounds like is that right yeah, yeah that's true yeah i mean at um at book fox we do I, I just do the whole thing you know it's developmental it's line editing and it's proofreading at the same time so it's one big thing but i yeah i always uh, i have certain i i sometimes send out i pretty much always send out poems that i poets that uh, poems by poets that i think they'll the poet will resonate with um and so kind of just you know because that's the way i learned you know i looked at i i wrote something and i said well i really love this poem why do i love it and i went and looked at the poem and saw what that poet was doing and i tried to incorporate that into my work so i do that for every poet who sends me work you know i have now i have a whole collection of, I have my resources and I have a collection of poems that I can just pull out that I've already kind of done, uh, copied and pasted. And uh, so that's, I think that's a useful thing. And then, and then I always, in my letter to the poets, I always say, okay, here's, here's what you're doing. Here's the habits you have that are good. And here's the habits I have that are, you have that are kind of working against you. Because I think that's, you know, becoming a good poet is kind of like becoming a better person. You know, you notice, oh man, I did that again. You know, I was mean to that woman or you know, I was mean to that man or I snapped, you know, or something, you know, you did something that you shouldn't have done. And so you recognize your habit and then you spend the rest of your life trying to correct that habit. <laughs> so, um, so I always say that, yeah, it's just like trying to be a better person, trying to be a better poet. So, and that's why I love, uh, that's what I love about it, uh, about editing and working with poets.
you make it sound like a really enjoyable experience. Do you ever find uh, poets uh, that kind of submit the work but don't really want the feedback, or you know, how can a how can a poet prepare themselves to receive the feedback in the best possible way? Yeah, I, uh, I, I just had that one poet who wanted to go one direction, and and I mean, I tried to push her in one direction that she didn't want to go, in, and I don't do that anymore. Now I ask. Um, that was the only person who who. Um, did not accept the feedback, but everybody else, I you know, I try, I try to present the feedback. I mean, one of the things I say is, there's a lot of comments on this poem, but there aren't as many comments as there are on my own poems. <laughs> so you know, as I as I try to work through my own poems, I'm like really diff tough on myself. Um, so, but you know, every it's not required that you take the feedback. Yeah, you know, your job as a, the writer, because you know where you're going, um, not to necessarily get offended by the feedback, but just to say, I'm going to pull this, I'm going to take this, I'm not going to take this. Um, and, you know, or, or, and then I ask, I encourage people to write back to me with questions. And so sometimes those, the questions I get are, I understand this, this, and this, but why did you tell me to do this? You know, and I'll write back and say, so yeah, accept the feedback, and and I think most editors will listen to you um, if you if you email them back and and reconsider or contextualize the, the the feedback. I think that's quite interesting because I think it really only happens in my experience, as far as I have seen, it that tends to really only happen with poetry. Edit, mm. editing that for longer work like novels or long nonfiction books the editor sends the edit and then the author works right. with the edit and on they go and you know if they were happy with it or not but maybe occasionally would question what why this or why that but not so, not so much yeah. i've seen with poetry editors it can almost turn into a dialogue um you know a very interesting dialogue and uh, a learning and teaching on both sides and in quite a different way. Uh, you do some editing of of um, other forms as well, not just poetry? Right, I, yeah, I do developmental work on novels. And I've edited novels um, for years for friends. <laughs> and, uh, and some of them have done really well. I worked with uh, Tommy Orange on a book called There There, which has been an international bestseller. Um, that was line by line editing, and it was more like editing poetry with him because he writes a very poetic novel. Um, but I do a lot of developmental editing through BookFox as well, uh, which I love. I mean, I also um, taught screenwriting and for ABC Disney for a while, so I had that kind of structural uh, training. So a lot of novelists will come to me, just read this and see if it has dramatic structure, you know, because novelists tend not to. Uh, at least literary novelists tend to follow the story through the characters. And so that a lot of times they don't really even know if there's any shape to their novel. So that's been useful. What is the difference between um, editing fiction and editing poetry? Oh, it's just an intense um, concentration on, in poetry on word choice first, you know, because you're, Sometimes you're dealing with 40 words. They all have to be right, you know, and condensation is really important in poetry, too. I think, you know, no matter what kind of poetry anyone is writing, it's always, always someone who chooses poetry is looking for some kind of succinct, right, succinct way of saying something very large. And so condens that focus on condensation, which means you have to focus on word choice. Um, if you, um, line breaks is a complicated thing, you know, to look at. Um, but I said, oh, most oh, go ahead. No, sorry. I, uh, did you say line breaks? You yeah. just slightly there. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about line breaks yeah. because um, that is something I think that editors give a lot of a lot of feedback and center after word choice. It's probably line break is the next most right. yeah. um, quality that's most kind of worked on. Talk to yeah. us a little bit about how you how do you know uh, the break doesn't work and should yeah. change? <laughs> yeah, well, I have a lot of theories about line break. But I mean, so if you're writing rhyme poetry, you know where the line break 
the break with the rhyme. Uh, rhyme poetry is really difficult to work on as an editor, especially if the poem's gone wrong, badly wrong, because then you you kind of have to ignore the rhymes and say, look, there's all these other problems in your poem. You know, you do it. Most people who use rhyme feel comfortable doing it. Um, so a rhymed poem is always a tricky thing. Um, I like doing it, but it's always means a little bit more work for everybody um, if it's going to continue to be a rhymed poem. Um, so if there are problems with like word choice and condensation and wordiness in the in the line, that makes it different. Um, but a lot of people are writing free verse. When you write free verse, um, the first thing I look at is line the line length, um, because I think what happens. I generally encourage a shorter line. People generally go too long. What happens when you write a long line is that it encourages wordiness, uh, encourages kind of, a, I hate to use the word laziness, but it's kind of a laziness where you just kind of, you allow idioms into your work or you, you, you allow extra words into the work to fill out the line. So the first thing I do is I, I cut the line in half most of the time and say, okay, work with this short line. It's a kind of vice on the language. It's like putting pressure on the language. My hands are going like this. It almost feels like a Donald Trump gesture, but um, it's uh, you put pressure on the on the on the language by shortening the line. So I always encourage people to try a short line, and then you can lengthen it later. But it squeezes out all the extra words when you go to a shorter line. Um, and then in terms of where to break a line, well, that's kind of an endless subject. Um, but but I, think, I also think it's very personal. I don't think there's an there's a, I don't think every poem comes with a perfect line break or a line length. I think it ends up being a kind of your personal um, choice as long as you know how you're making that choice. You know, so there's a lot of things you can do with a line break. I always think you know the, I always think in terms of song. I know I have a lot to say about this. Um, I always think if you think about it when you sing, like one of the things that happens is you hit the you you come into the line with a lot of air. And so that first word has a, a lot of force on it. And then the last word right before you turn to take your next breath of air often has a lot of force on it. So just in terms of the way we say the line, um, that happens. So you want the beginnings and your ends of your lines to be important and not throw away since you're going to hit those a little bit harder. So I, I basically take a biological approach to the, to the line. Uh, so that's the first thing. I mean, there's a million things to talk about. I mean, you can spread your poems across the page. There's a lot of choices to be made. And again, finally, it's going to be a personal choice, but I'll have advice along the way. The poem decides, I guess. Yeah, I've written, my poems are as diverse as anybody's poems. You know, if you look, flip through my books, it looks like it was written by a committee uh, <laughs> because I, I enjoy all the different kind of shapes, forms. And talk to us before we let you go, just talk to us a little bit about your own, your own poetic development. I mean, you told us uh, very interestingly there about how you started. I, I, I was saying before, before we came in the pre-chat, um, that I think being a construction worker is a is a brilliant uh, uh, metaphor for um, you know what a poet should do before they actually turn to constructing right. poems. Yeah. Um, but yeah, now you're still writing. You've got you've got a book coming, I know. Um, tell us a bit about the work that you're doing right now, and and has your editing fed into your own work? Right. Well. Yeah, I mean, because I taught myself, I kind of, I had like, create, in fact, I have this thing called strategies for revising poems, and it's just like an endless list of things that I've done myself. Um, I mean, I think the advantage I've had as a teacher is I had to teach myself. And so I, I didn't have someone there. I didn't have a workshop to tell me what to do. So I had to figure, I had to create a workshop in my mind. <laughs> and so I, I've worked for years in creating this list of techniques. And so if I, you know, if I find myself stuck, I can go to that list. And I usually give this to my students too. I give them that list. I go to that list and I can, you know, you know, try writing past the current end of the poem, try cutting the current end. You know, so I have all these, try cutting the current end and writing past it. So I have a, a whole bunch of um, strategies that I developed by it because I learned myself. Um, I forget what was the other part of the question. No, I would love to see that list. Would you be yeah, willing yeah. to share that with our with our listeners? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that, yeah. that would be that would be fantastic. We put it in. 
we put it into the you can share it with me afterwards and um, we'll put it into the show notes for the for the actual show but i'm sure a lot of them would appreciate that and uh, that would be very useful thank you yeah so i was wondering um working as an editor has that improved your own poetry or has it fed into your own poetry in any way this this kind of new life you have i know it's um, the editing is kind of a continuation of your teaching vocation but it's it's a bit different too so i'm just wondering if if it has made uh, wrought any changes in your own work it's it's wrought a greater appreciation for the kind of range of poetries that are out there you know i've had to go um and look at everything you know I've been I've been I've been to Walmart, which is the big <laughs> box store out here, and there's poetry in Walmart. And so I went down the aisle and I picked them all up and I I read to see what um, you know because a lot of my uh, clients are headed that direction, and so I needed to know like, and I needed to understand like what is it that makes this book a bestseller, you know, and this one, you know can't get published you know so i have a lot to say about that rupee the rupee core the best-selling phenomenon which i let's, think has, yeah has, let's talk talk a little bit about that because i mean it is the self-publisher's dream to be selling in walmart um let's face it and right. and rupee has been so influential in yeah. terms of you know on instagram obviously but also um hugely influential in what's selling on amazon and in in other places yeah so talk, oh, yeah. talk to me a little bit about your thoughts on that from an yeah. editorial perspective yeah well well yeah i don't think it, it would be hard to replicate her success but um but what she did of course was to start on instagram you know work social media also to become a personality. I mean, she's, you know, kind of a compelling personality. I've seen her on late night talk shows. She's totally comfortable doing that. Um, so really it's a package, you know, the work by itself probably wouldn't have gone, you know, anywhere near where it went without the whole package. So I think if you want to go that route, you've got to create yourself, you know, Instagram influencer, you know, you have to, and, and I see a lot of people trying to do it. And I don't know quite how you separate yourself from the pack, but I think there it can be done. It certainly can be done there. You know, other people are right alongside her. Um, but the work itself is, I mean, the way that operates is it's very direct poetry, very direct about emotions, very brief. You know, I think those things, those qualities work. And then she, of course, has the, the visual element too, which isn't a bad idea. Uh, so, but there's a little magic too that operates. Yeah. As you say, it's not it's not replicable. And also, I think there was a timing thing. Uh, yeah. I think right. you know it it hit it hit at a certain time. Okay, Sue. Um, so just before we leave, Sue Williams has dropped us a poem. Can you read that? Can you see the comments? I have the comment. Let's see. I don't see it. It's not in the chat. Oh wait, here over, over in the comments. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Are you, seeing, are you seeing that? It's called Urban Kiss. All right. So, so first thing I would ask is like, where are we going? <laughs> you know. Um, but I'll assume uh, I'll just assume, I'll just take it as a poem and see what happens. Uh, yeah. we go? Um, maybe Sue will drop another comment to tell us, you know, what yes. what is your um, poetic intention, Sue, for for this poem? Where where are you going with this? Because this is the first question that John always asks. Yeah. But yeah, let's have a look at it just as words for now. And also, I think possibly she wasn't able to do her line breaks because of the yeah, li right. li limitations of the comments yeah. um, format. But yeah, let's give it a go and see. It'll uh, be fun. Uh, can I read it aloud? Do we have time? I don't know. Where yes, we have time. We'll make time. Yeah. All right. Urban Kiss. Dark and edgy, teetering. I wonder if the capital there means line break. But dark and edgy, teetering on the brink of urban sprawl. The rocky road to our first kiss explodes into vibrant color. Now tightly head, held in thrall, silhouetted against the skyline, backs no longer pressed against the wall, merging deep into blissful eternity as rainbow colors sublimely radiate and majestically fall. Okay, so first of all, um, 
I would probably not approach this as a literary poem, but as you know, very a very different kind of poem, closer to to what Rupi Kaur, for lack of a, you know, since we've been talking about her, um, than than a literary poem. Uh, although the language is really interesting at times in this poem. Um, so, dark and edgy, teetering on the brink of urban sprawl, all seems, at first look, very good. You know, I might play with those words. Um, the rocky road to our first kiss. Rocky road, I would say, eh, it's kind of a cliche. Like maybe there's a better way to, to approach that. I would look at that. Um, you know, again, just to say a poem should be fret, no matter what kind of poem you're writing, the language should be as fresh as possible, right? Um, so I would look at the rocky road um, to our first kiss. Oh, I guess the capital letters look like the beginnings of lines. So it explodes into vibrant color. So Vibrant color is interesting, but I, I kind of want to, I kind of want to know what colors those are. Maybe instead, like I would push toward the particular there, maybe. Um, and again, this is a quick take. It's sort of general rules. Um, I love in, I love the the enthrall in in that next whatever line. Now tightly held enthrall. Um, there's something interesting about that i mean to be in thrall is to be in in um in kind of a a loss of power that's really interesting for a kiss um silhouetted against the skyline backs no longer pressed against the wall um i like the idea in terms of like it's almost like this uh um cinematic image of being uh, silhouetted against the skyline there's a little problem with the grammar in there and it probably should be silhouetted against the skyline there should be a we there um so that we have the you know because um, it's more than the backs that are silhouetted silhouetted against the skyline maybe our backs uh, or we I, I should it probably should be we probably should get the whole figure and then backs no longer pressed against the wall so there's a sense of being freed by this kiss um, from, you know, backs against the wall as an um, uh, expression of like being up against it, like, you know, like desperate. Uh, backs no longer pressed against the wall, merging deep into blissful eternity. Here's where it gets a little tricky with blissful eternity. Um, again, kind of a generalization. It's okay, but I would always try to push past that. Like what, what really, when we, when we merge, you know, what really is it? Like, is there a physical way, a metaphorical way to talk about that uh, rather than blissful eternity? So I would look at that. Um, and then uh, as rainbow colors sublimely radiate and majestically fall, I like the majestically fall again, because it's kind of a Gothic poem, uh, but rainbow colors for me, again, the, the, the kind of generalization of that and so i would i would ask to push further on that uh so by, so so i like all of it i would just like spotlight certain areas where the language could um be a little bit more particular and and maybe metaphorical instead of descriptive um so that's where i would start i mean it would take me a while to really work the poem over on methodical and you know i probably make like two dollars an hour in my <laughs> most of the time because i have to keep looking at it but i'm interested in the work uh, uh in this kind of, it feels almost like this could be a, a graphic novel uh, you know a, a poem with kind of an illustration or within an illustration uh, which would be which would really interest me lovely that's that's really great thank you john and thank you sue uh, for for putting your poem out there to be edited like that publicly. uh brave act so i hope you found it useful um yeah. i was written about a picture someone painted all right get that painting put it next to your to your phone instagram moment sue yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we are out of time now. Um, I, I would like to say a big thank you, John. Thank you so much for coming in and talking to us um, about editing. Will you tell people where they can find you if they would like to, to uh, pursue the editing uh, more formally? Right. Well, I'm on BookFox, which is, I think it's the johnfox.com is, is the address. 
And then my own website that I don't know is johndavispoet.com, I think. johndavispoet.com. I looked it up. And again, we will have the um, all of the, the uh, um, website addresses and everything else that you've kind of kindly given to us um will be on the show notes for the podcast which will be out next friday on the self-publishing advice um center selfpublishingadvice.org is what you need to to watch out for for that people so yeah john thank you so much it's your birthday on wednesday i know so a very happy birthday you're doing something nice i have no plans yet but it turns on the snow oh yeah okay well you can write a poem about snow if nothing else. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure, yeah. I, I, it could be kind of fun to come on and just do one where people post poems and we talk about them. Why don't uh, we do that? Why don't yeah. we get, get you back in in, in a, a couple of, we have our, our um, topics are worked out for the next few months, but say early in the new year, might be nice to do to to do that. Let's let's say that we will do that. I, I don't know. I said that it's, it's an impossible thing to do, but it, but it was kind of fun. No, it's fun, and I think the spontaneity of it um, is actually it's, it's usually very useful. I know you go back, and there are second thoughts and and, and more with with editing, but always that first flush, I think, is very interesting. So um, and useful, I hope. So and the strategies for revising poems too. That's right. fantastic. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you again. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. And thank you to everyone. Happy writing and happy publishing. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. All right.